All right, good afternoon. I guess it's, uh, I have 412, so I guess we can start. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I just, uh, I flew in this morning. I landed at 630, so if I start spouting gibberish, that's why, you'll know. Um, so first of all, an introduction to who I am. Uh, my name is Walt Miner. I work for the Linux Foundation on automotive grade Linux. I've been with the Linux Foundation and automotive grade Linux now for two years. And prior to that, I worked for some tier one suppliers, namely uh, Continental and Motorola Telematics. I also worked for some Linux suppliers, um, particularly Montevista. So I've spent a lot of time in the automotive industry and in uh, mobile devices with uh, Linux in general. And I also like to ride a motorcycle, although that, I don't own that BMW, everybody. I like people to think I own a BMW. It makes me seem like I'm very uh, hip and with it. And <clears throat> this slide I showed, we have uh, at AGL, we have an all member meeting twice a year. And this slide I showed at uh, our member meeting in Munich about a month ago. Um, one of the reasons I really like AGL uh, is has been the opportunity to work with a variety of different tier ones and a variety of different tier twos and the collaboration that people are really showing around automotive, which in my past experience working for a tier one, it's always been uh, very cutthroat, very dog eat dog. And you can see, I made this, I took uh, the Git logs from January of this year through September, beginning of September this year. And you can see we had a, no, a, a number of different people with commits with uh, 18 different companies represented. And there have been times where we've been integrating software in a room with multiple tier ones sitting down together and multiple OEMs sitting down together, all working on the same code base. So AGL really is all about collaboration. And you'll see it's not just tier ones and, and OEMs on this list, but also smaller companies, uh, some individuals. It's really been a, a great show of collaboration amongst the members. And if I went back to the beginning of uh, the uh, UCB or the unified code base for AGL, the list would expand even larger and the number of companies would be even larger. So that's really been the thing that I've been excited about within uh, automotive grade Linux. So this is my, this is my, by the way, I, at the all member meeting and now here at Embedded Linux conference, I can say this is your, you can be famous slide. If you contribute to AGL, even one commit and you'll get on the slide. So you too can be famous. And um, so <clears throat> today's goal, so, um, basically to, to educate you about what AGL is all about. Um, how to access, how to get to our source code and uh, our documentation, and basically, in general, generate interest in participating in AGL and show you all the different places that you can uh, participate. Where are you? Sorry about that. So, um, our tagline is, collab is collaborating to build the car of the future through rapid innovation. And really, I, I wanted to show that earlier slide with all the different people who've been committing code to our uh, repositories, that it is really a collaboration. It's not just um, a, a few people sitting in a room writing software and throwing it over the wall. It really has been a lot of different people collaborating at a lot of different levels from device drivers to the test infrastructure to applications. And we really, we've really shown a lot of great collaboration in the year and a half or so that we've had this, this online open code base. And Dan Kaushi, my boss, um, made the statement that if Linux is in the car, it, we, want, we, want AGL to be, we want it to be based on AGL no matter what the function is, whether it's an IVI system, a telematics system, navigation, um, working our way, in, into the ecosystem of the vehicle where it is appropriate. And if you saw Greg's uh, talk this morning, his fireside chat this morning, there's still going to be ECUs in the car that are really too small to have Linux. And okay, that's fine. But if Linux is in the car, we really, we want people to think about AGL first. So we really are code first. Um, AGL is a collaboration project of the Linux Foundation. Um, 
we were leveraging Linux and open source technologies across the board, not just Linux, but all through the, the ecosystem uh, up, up into the application space. Um, we're trying to develop about 80%, our, our goal, our stated goal is to develop about 80% of the starting point for a production project so that a tier one or an OEM could take our code and turn it into a finished product in a much shorter amount of time than they have been. Traditionally, these IVI systems have taken three years plus. I think I finished the project when I was working with Monta Vista that I had quoted. We finished the project in 2013 and we quoted it in 2009. So to give you an idea of the time span of rolling out a new IVI system. And we really want to shorten that down uh, to half or less that time. So AGL is a code first organization. We have, we have some documentation in terms of specs, but we're not focused on specs. We're focused on writing the code. We understand that our, our belief is that if you write a spec, uh, an API spec, and it's just a document that stands alone, the spec and the code, as everybody knows, tend to drift apart. So really we're saying here's, here's the code, here's some documents on top of that, but um, really focus on getting the code done first. We, uh, we have eight different OEMs that have joined uh, AGL at this point. And you can see that that spans from uh, Japan, uh, Toyota, Mazda, Subaru, Honda, uh, Mitsubishi Motors, um, to the US with Ford, and uh, Europe with Jaguar Land Rover. And this is always, we're always gaining new members. We have at the time I made this slide, we had, uh, I think, 76 different members on this slide. Now we seem to be gaining traction with about a new member every week or so. Um, I think we're over, we're over 80. I think we're up to around 85 different members now on AGL. And you can see the level of commitment. We have uh, four different membership tiers, platinum, gold, silver, and uh, bronze. So really, we, we, AGL, we really believe we're changing the industry and how, how car manufacturers, how OEMs and tier ones interact with software, how they interact with their customers, and eventually how customers interact with their vehicles, um, and how vehicles interact with the cloud. We have, we have members that are focused on all different parts of the ecosystem from uh, the, the deep guts of the vehicle messaging subsystem all the way up through the cloud infrastructure and cloud to I accidentally said this morning, I, I told somebody it was cloud to ground infrastructure, <laughs> but uh, the cloud to ground, ground ecosystem. But um, <clears throat> we really are focusing on all different levels, both of our applications and our uh, middleware. By the way, I, for the life of me, we had some problems with my slides, and for the life of me, my slides on my screen show up about that big. So I cannot see them. That's why I keep looking up there to make sure which slide I put in what order. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we have uh, the AGL now has a, um, what we're calling a unified code base. Up, and th up through, AGL is about, um, I think five or six years old. It predates me by a few years. And originally we were using Tizen IVI as our code base. And Tizen IV the IVI part of Tizen kind of went away. Uh, almost two years ago, and in terms of support in the ecosystem. So we decided within the, the AGL advisory board to take the best parts of Tizen, take the best parts of, of Geneva, and take the best parts of other open source components and put those together into what we call the unified code base. Um, we first announced that in uh, March of 2015, so about a year and a half ago, and the first release was at CES in January in, in Las Vegas. That was uh, Agile Albacore, we called it. And um, it's Yocto, Pocky-based, with uh, some, some AGL-specific layers on top of that. And I'll show how we, we structure the layers in a, in a few minutes. So being the, you know, I, we first called this AGL distribution and people wanted a better name. So I, being the creative type on the program, came up with Fish. 
Um, so we, we name our releases after fish. Uh, Agile Albacore was our initial release back in January. Uh, in July, we had our Brilliant Blowfish release. And coming up in December, in time for CES of 2017, we'll have our Charming Chinook release. And uh, D fishes were kind of hard, but I came up with Daring Dab. Um, somewhere I have a picture of one later on. So that'll, that'll be our, uh, our mid-year. So we're on a basically an every six month cadence, release cadence. And um, we, along with those releases of the middleware and the, uh, the BSPs, we also are releasing demo applications. And at, both at CES this year and at the Automotive Linux Summit in July of this year, we, we showed some demonstrations of the, of the AGL releases. And uh, there's a video available of the CES uh, demonstration on YouTube um, that shows what we put together. We put together a demonstration that showed uh, our board controlling a, an HVAC system, a simulated HVAC system with, with fans and, and actuators for the vents, as well as a multimedia system, uh, some navigation, um, uh, a home screen, things like that. And we keep improving upon that, at, expanding upon that as we go along. The, the other thing that, in terms of collaboration, I wanted to, I wanted to mention, at ALS in July, um, we had released Brilliant Blowfish, and we had 15, I think it was 15 different sponsors uh, with booths at ALS. And I was very, I was amazed at the, the number of different applications that people had developed on top of AGL, and I didn't even, had no idea. I learned you know, I learned during those days, during the few weeks before, people came up to me and said, here, look what we've done. Look at this application. And they were showing it at Automotive Linux Summit. So what you'll see in a few minutes, what we've decided to do is kind of open up the ecosystem a little more in terms of demonstrations. And we're calling, we're, we're, we're calling for, I sent out some calls for participation so that people can submit their applications and have them part of the official demonstrator. Because one of the things that we kept getting questions about two days before CES, you know, a week before ALS was, how can I be part of the official booth? So again, if you, if you have an application, you have a cool application, you have a cool piece of hardware, you wanna show it at CES or at ALS as part of the official AGL suite, there's now a mechanism for you to, to participate, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll show that in a minute. So, as part of ALS, we released our Brilliant Blowfish release. Um, one of the things that we're committed to doing is um, occasional patch releases, occasional updates. So since then, we've had two patch releases. We just made a second one on Friday, 2.0.2. Uh, .2. Um, <clears throat> we are using, with this release with, with Blowfish, we're using Yocto 2.0. We added our, uh, we added some additional BSPs on top of what we were showing with Agile Albacore. I've got the list, I think, on the next slide. Uh, we added the IVI Audio Manager, which we somewhat borrowed from Geneva, somewhat added some of our own plugins. Uh, the IVI Layer Manager, and a significant amount of automated test improvements using uh, Fuego, which uh, I think Tim mentioned uh, this morning during his, uh, his introduction. So we became one of the early adopters of Fuego. So this was the list of, of BSPs that we have. Um, we, we have basically what we're calling reference BSPs and community BSPs. Uh, reference BSPs are fully supported by the manufacturers of the board. They're helping with updating the BSP with integration, things like that. Community BSPs are typically either older automotive boards or hobbyist boards, and they're really, they really represent the AGL community best effort at maintaining the BSPs and the applications on top of them. And you can see we've got a pretty wide variety of different boards available. And as we go through Charming Chinook, we're adding to the support for each of these. Um, 
So, and we're adding additional, we're adding additional support for new, for new boards as we go through this uh, process. The, <clears throat> this is probably a bit of an eye chart, but the, the qualifications for being a reference board include not just um, the BSP being maintained by the board manufacturer, but uh, having a, do a documentation and a quick start guide so that you can buy that board, get going pretty quickly, write an application, and have it running in a very short amount of time. Uh, a lot of times you get the board and you, you might want to put some, we'll call it non-standard distribution. AGL would be a non-standard distribution for, say, a Raspberry Pi. And uh, nobody really tells you how to do that. So we're trying to put together a quick and easy st quick start guide for each of our boards on how to grab our code and, and get going. Um, basically get those, those builds into our continuous integration infrastructure, our automated testing, things like that. So for the complete list of boards that we have at any given moment, you can, it's on our wiki site. Um, the wiki site will also point you to the source, uh, both the source Git repositories, uh, tarballs for the releases, and um, binaries for the, the reference boards that might be available. <clears throat> so for Charming Chinook, which is coming up in uh, December, January timeframe, we're looking to have a complete SDK available for app developers. In fact, we're asking that the, uh, as part of the, the CFP that we're doing for CES apps, that any apps that we get from developers run in our, uh, SD, in our application framework, which is being uh, highlighted by our, our software development kit. Um, the AGL compositor is probably not going to happen in this time frame, um, but we'll, we're working on, uh, we've got someone working on the AGL home screen reference app in Qt. We're also looking at doing one in HTML5. Um, we're adding, looking at adding device profiles for telematics in particular. We've had a lot of interest from the community in adding telematics devices. Um, we've got IP network management in terms of uh, we have Conman in our build, and we're looking to add uh, device management on top of that, as well as some reference applications for controlling Wi-Fi and controlling Bluetooth. Uh, another thing we're trying to we're moving away from is we we were using we have been using um, a tool called Doors NG for. Uh, requirements management. That tool is very cumbersome and difficult to use. Um, there's probably only a few people on the project who actually understand the tool. Um, and by few, I mean one. Um, the, other guy, the other guy quit. <laughs> uh, so we're trying to move our, all of our documentation into something standard that all developers understand, which is create the documentation from using Markdown and then publish that directly to the web. Um, so we're, we're, we're piloting that now with uh, some, some of the documents that we're currently creating with the idea that we're going to I'll move the uh, requirements back out of Doors NG and into Markdown and we'll maintain it that way. Uh, the requirements spec that we have was written uh, about 18 months ago, was released uh, during the 2015 ALS, and it's really, it's not really a it's more of a marketing requirements document than it is an engineering requirements document. It really focuses on what we'd like the AGL to be. Uh, and again, because we're code first, uh, not, there hasn't been as much interest in, in updating the documents. Engineers don't like updating high-level requirements specs. So um, we're hoping that by moving it to Markdown, we'll at least encourage people to, to update the document uh, just the other tool is just extremely uh, difficult to figure out and not very user friendly. So
So the first document we're focusing on there is the AGL security spec. So we have a security blueprint document that we have uh, in progress where we want to at least explain to developers and uh, people who are interested in AGL what it is you get out of the box uh, in the AGL application framework with uh, security. So that's something that's in progress. The A um, <clears throat> little bit more on the SDK. So we want that available for all of our reference boards with the published images uh, and, and that including the graphics drivers. As you know, anybody who's working with embedded boards, the, the graphics drivers, the, the faster, the better drivers tend to be proprietary and we don't have redis redistribution rights. So we've been working with our BS, with our board vendors to get redistribution rights so that we can fully publish the binaries and make them available to people. And like I said before, our goal here is rapid, rapid innovation, rapid development. And the, the goal that I stated, I put out there is you should be able to uh, sit down and write your, what I call your Hello Walt application uh, in an hour or less and have that running on the board. And so the first time I tried doing this uh, last year, just prior to CES, it took me with the instructions that we had, it took me three days. So, uh, and it was not a fun process. So getting that down from three days to less than an hour is my, is my stated goal here. Um, we'd like support for both Qt, Qt and HTML5 based applications, um, having an IDE with full debugging supported. Uh, of course, documentation, these quick start guides so that you can get going, you can, you can get your stuff up and running in less than an hour. Um, and one of the difficulties we have now is if you want to use our code, you re it really does rely, if you want to modify the code, it really does rely on a certain amount of Yocto knowledge. And the, the, more you, the deeper you get into it in terms of device drivers or adding new, uh, adding new code, there's really a lot of Yocto knowledge that becomes required. So we really want to get it so that the app developers don't have to worry about that. They don't need to know the, uh, the, the, the guts of the build system. Um, HGL compositor. So there's nothing really out there on the market in terms of open source that meets all the needs for an automotive IVI system in terms of a compositor. So um, <clears throat> there, there are, you know, the Qt, the Qt compositor is very good. Um, you know, Qt has a commercial license for a lot of its stuff, so we're trying to not use the Qt, reuse the Qt compositor. Um, so ideally, we're looking for a member company to donate a solution. We have a member company that has uh, stepped up and is offering one. We're, they're in the process of clearing it through their uh, internal processes to make sure they can actually donate it. And hopefully we should have a, a, at least a starting point for an AGL compositor beginning of next year. I don't think it'll happen for uh, Charming Chinook because we all know that com big companies take a long time to clear things through lawyers. Um, We'll skip this. We talked about network management briefly already. So Daring Dab, which is our, our next release, uh, middle of next year prior to ALS, we're looking at uh, Smart Device Link, which is the Ford-developed open source Miracast type solution. Uh, they've open sourced this. Uh, it's primarily, their, their primary implementation is uh, QNX based, but there is a, a Linux implementation available. And they've started working with us on, on porting that to AGL. Um, and then as we expand our, we've been really focusing on building out our infrastructure, uh, building out the initial application framework, and you know, giving people the ability to, to, to add APIs to that. So some of the APIs we want to focus on in terms of uh, reusable components down the road are navigation, speech services, browser engine, so that people can then come in with a, the applications can have a consistent API and people can come in and plug in whichever solution they want. And in some cases like speech or navigation, they could be either onboard or offboard solutions. 
And we'd like that as much as possible to be transparent to the, to the applications. So again, we're looking for, we had a, at our all member meetings, we had some, some boffs there with interested parties and looking for donations from members because we know that anybody who's developed an IVI system already has a speech API. They already have a navigation API. So if we could get one that works, uh, donated as a starting point, that would be the ideal situation rather than uh, trying to start one from scratch. So one of the questions we got asked originally, in fact, one of the questions I used to ask before I joined AGL is, what is AGL? How do I know what, I, what AGL is? So <clears throat> we, uh, this year, through the, the beginning of the, through the first half of the year, we worked through how to, how to describe that and uh, came up with some requirements for what is the AGL core distribution, what are the extra features, what are the optional things on top of that, uh, what are the uh, more future-looking features that people might be developing, et cetera. So um, we, we came up with this concept of the AGL core distribution. So if in that, that's basically the, the stable Yocto release that we've decided to use. Um, in, in the case of uh, Brilliant Blowfish, it's, it's 2.1, 2.0. In Charming Chinook, we're moving to two, uh, Yocto 2.1. Um, it's those reference BSPs. It's the documentation and tooling that you need to build a, an AGL, uh, to, to create, build AGL, basically. Um, it's test results that are provided using the AGL test, test framework, which is using Fuego. Um, fully supported with updates for at least six months, because like I said, we're on a six month uh, release cadence. So we've been working through the release management process. We've now made patch releases to Brilliant Blowfish a few times. And uh, we have a, a Yocto layer called Meta AGL that defines that. So basically what we're saying, instead of having a, a complicated compliance spec, uh, we have basically use Meta AGL, and that is AGL. Um, so like I said, we're code first. Then we want to provide a mechanism for enabling optional or experimental features. So we, we developed two layers. We, we created two layers. The uh, AGL extras, basically it builds on meta AGL. It builds on the core distribution. Um, the features are fully tested and are supported as part of the release. Um, we, we have device profiles that might be supported through uh, AGL extras. We, we really worked hard on coming up with a name, so of course we called it Meta AGL Extra. We, uh, and we, we also created this thing called Meta AGL Devil, which is those forward-looking features that may eventually make it into the AGL core or into AGL extras, so they may eventually be fully supported, but Right now, they're not. They're being, they're being worked on by the community. And we have a process for considering moving them from uh, meta AGL development to meta AGL or extras. We provide daily snapshot builds uh, for all of our boards. Um, we may have snapshot builds for the experimental features. It depends on how far into their life cycle they are. We may not. Um, we're basically not providing formal QA for those. The community um, will, will do whatever they feel they need to do for QA on those features. Um, so, and then those community BSPs, th th those technically would be, I would consider those part of meta AGL uh, devil, but it doesn't, doesn't really fit that model, but that's kind of my way I look at it. And then we needed an environment for, uh, um, de for, for dem demonstrators, for adding applications, for adding code that might be one shot in nature. Maybe we're using an application that we're, we're creating an application for CES. 
Uh, we want people to be able to play with that. So we have a Meta AGL demo application. Um, all of our uh, ALS and CES applications are available through, through Meta AGL demo. So for, uh, in terms of release management, we're doing twice a year, uh, twice a year code releases with, with binaries for the uh, reference BSPs. Um, we eventually may get to a model where we have long-term support. We've had members ask about this, uh, say two plus years of support as uh, say some of our members go to production with a system. We, work at, we have that under consideration. At this point, we've had no request from any of our members to do this yet, so it's a, it's a, it'll, it'll come, we know it'll come someday and we're planning for it. Uh, right now, we'd, I couldn't tell you which release might end up being a long-term, a long-term, you know, two-year plus supported release. Um, but we do provide daily snapshot builds and um, for all of, our, all of our reference BSPs, some of our community BSPs, et cetera. So this in its totality, which is another bit of an eye chart, I'm sure, uh, is all of the different Yocto layers that we have. Not even all of them, there's, you know, there's always more. But this is the, the basic structure of our Yocto layers for AGL. So how do you get all this stuff? Um, this, this, I'll post this presentation today so you don't have to worry about getting these links. There's, some of them are long. Um, all of our uh, pre-built binaries and source tarballs are available at that link. And the uh, latest uh, source code and build instructions are available as well. Uh, so you can, you can generally find all of our latest stuff. It's in Garrett. Um, it's in Git. Um, one of the things that we had to do, we, we had to think through uh, in the last six months was with the meta AGL extras and developer features, we, we, we had requests from members, oh, I don't want, maybe I don't want to add this particular thing. Maybe I don't want to add the uh, uh, network boot or maybe I don't want to add uh, the application framework. I want to test it without it. So we had to come up with some tooling around uh, optional, optional features. Um, we just released that as part of Brilliant Blowfish. And um, this basically, if you go to uh, AGL setup, that's our, our setup script now. And that basically lets you configure the optional features and the development features that you want to run with. And I think, no, I had a list. I must have lost it. I had a list of all the optional development features so that you could mix and whatever you want to mix and match on top of the initial AGL build. We're trying to simplify that because Yocto does tend to be a little complicated when you want to just add something that uh, we think should be relatively simple to, to enable to turn on or to turn off. So uh, we, have, uh, we have this uh, setup script now developed. So this was, the, uh, this was the call for participation for our um, reference apps for basically uh, how, do, how do you, how can you, if you want, if you had a, a cool app you want to show as part of our demonstration suite, or if you want to just include it in the meta AGL demo layer and have people uh, have the ability to contribute to it, um, we're at, we've asked people to if they want to, if they want to contribute something, so we've had a, quite a good response from this. I sent this out maybe three weeks ago. Um, we're trying to. There's still time. If you have a cool app, you're just thinking to yourself, "Hey, I've got something I want to do." There's still time to submit it. Um, basically, you send me. There's a little form to fill out and an email. Um, I don't think I put the schedule in here, but basically, we have uh, the initial. Uh, Applications are due, the beta versions are due by November 15th. 
so that we can get them fully integrated for the, the CES demo. We also had probably less of le maybe of less interest to people here, but we also had uh, people asking, how can I get my hardware in? Um, so we did a similar thing in, call, in terms of a call for participation from hardware vendors. And so we've had some, some interesting responses there as well. So we should be showing a number of new BSPs uh, at the, with the Charming Chinook release. We have, uh, you know, one of my jobs is really to make sure that uh, people are collaborating. People are, people know what to do if they, people don't get stuck, basically. So we, we started some time ago, was a weekly developer call. Anybody's welcome to call in. If you have, a, if you're trying to work with AGL and you can't figure out something, call in. There's, there's people on the call. We can usually uh, point you in the right direction. We've also got uh, mail lists uh, available. I think I've got a link to how to sign up for the mail lists. And um, we really, you know, particularly need developers in the middleware and the application space. Um, so, and we have Jira available if you want to see all of our, uh, any open issues and you feel like you have something you, you might be interested in working on, go look through the the issue list, and you're more than welcome to participate. So we've got a, a contribution process. It's fairly lightweight at this point um, in terms of there's no code contribution agreement or anything required at this point in time. Um, and the process uh, we, we, we try to make it as flexible as possible and we're trying, we continue to evolve it as we go. Um, we're using, obviously, Git. Uh, we're using Garrett, uh, despite uh, Greg's reservations about it. Um, and the, uh, the links for finding those uh, are, are here as well. So garrett.automotivelinux.org. We, um, uh, this isn't. So we're using uh, Jenkins for continuous integration. Um, we just did a significant amount of work to upgrade our Jenkins infrastructure. Um, we now, we've been for some quite a, for quite a quite a long time. We've had Jenkins builds being done on every uh, submission code submission to Garrett. Um, now, recently, we're, we're moving to, we would only build it for, I think, the Kimu build, and uh, if that worked, everything was good. And so recently, um, Jan Simon did a lot of work on upgrading that, and it's now kicking off builds for all the different bo reference boards. And if you submit a patch, basically submit some code, it has to be built by, successfully built by Jenkins before we can uh, um, approve it. And we're moving towards adding auto automated testing into that as well as just a, a, a build. So having some kind of smoke test for the, the patches as well. So basically every day we have uh, snapshot builds that we put we make available, basically binaries that are available for download that come out of Jenkins as well. Um, this is the link for our uh, AGL test framework, which is uh, based on Fuego. Uh, we have a continuous integration and automated test expert group. They have a call every two weeks. Um, they're very active as well. A lot of our uh, contributors that you saw listed on there are contributing to the test framework or the test cases themselves. So um, if that's something you're interested in, um, there's definitely a lot of activity around uh, automated testing and continuous integration. So we have some also some running ex what we call expert groups. Um, I hate the word, the term expert groups because um, we really don't actually require you to be an expert. Um, I 
personally have said not, I don't want to be an expert in anything. Um, it, it implies too much pressure. Um, so basically we have four expert groups that are, are up and running. I think they all meet every other week except for uh, one, the UI and graphics expert group that meets once a week on Mondays. And every expert group has a dedicated wiki page. So, and from the wiki page, you can get a link to the meeting minutes, to their project backlog in JIRA, to their roadmap, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of good stuff from there. And so the first, uh, first one we have is the app framework and uh, security expert group. Um, so they're in charge of obviously, or they're working on obviously the application framework and security. Um, but then you'll see that the main topics I listed for each of the expert groups are in green. Um, the breadth of some of the expert groups is quite large, mostly because we didn't want to form a lot of groups with only one person or two people that were interested. We wanted to have some uh, critical mass to each of the groups. So uh, we kind of bundled stuff into the expert groups that maybe don't belong there. And as we get as we get critical mass into a particular topic, we will spin off a new expert group. So you can see um, App Framework also has things like uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnostics and uh, Secure Boot, um, which may eventually get spun off. And for each of the expert groups, I included a link to their, to their wiki page so you can quickly find them. We have uh, UI and graphics. And this one, I think, has the truly strangest mix of things. Um, it's got not just UI and graphics, like the compositor and layer manager and GPU interface. It also has multimedia, uh, the media player, a browser engine, speech rec, navigation, uh, you name it. So kind of the separation here was the app framework guys got the core infrastructure of the you know, application plumbing, so to speak. And the UI and the graphics guys ended up with the applications themselves, is kind of the way it, it fell out. We have a connectivity expert group. Um, again, and actually their green stuff, I should move some more of their green stuff up. They're also looking at uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, um, connected car and remote vehicle interactions have become uh, hotter topics within this group. And so this is a pretty wide ranging group from guys like uh, uh, Microchip who are interested in you know, CAN and most connectivity to uh, other people who are interested in, in cloud connectivity. So it, it's, it's a really diverse group of interests um, that eventually probably will get split into some kind of subgroups once we get more uh, critical mass. So this is our uh, continuous integration oops, and automated test group. Um, so that was it for my slides. I think I still have a few minutes left for questions. And uh, Jan Simon, did you have a question? Five minutes. So any questions? So what I was thinking while you were while you were talking. So if I have an IMX board and a, and a, and a touch touch screen, and I want to hack install an infotainment system in my old car, what, uh, what how does uh, AGL help me in terms of integrating uh, interacting with the car as opposed to a, a other distribution? Uh, the, the bottom line is what we want to have is the plumbing so that you can talk to the car in terms of the, a, a way to talk to the CAN bus. Um, I highly doubt we'll have you know, messages or messaging available for specific vehicles. You may have to go figure that out yourself and plug it into our system. But I do know somebody who's done that. <laughs> a guy that I used to work with at Continental built his own head unit 
uh, based on a, an old IMX35 board and plugged it into his uh, car. So it, it can be done. I know, I know some guys have done it. Um, so we'll have the basics, the applications available. We'll have at least the plumbing available to talk to CAN. We probably will not have the CAN message sets for particular vehicles because those tend to be very proprietary um, and nobody wants to give those, give those up. Application well, tier ones, because the tier ones, are, the tier, the way the automotive ecosystem works is the tier ones are usually responsible for delivering the, the final product, final IVI system. Uh, so some combination of the tier ones and the OEMs, but then enabling an ecosystem around that so that people can jump in and participate. And you know, there's a whole tier two, tier three ecosystem that's out there already. So you know, being able to move from one IVI system to another today, if I want to move from, you know, if I want to work on a, a Mercedes system this week, this year, and move to a Toyota system next year, it's a completely different environment. And what we want to do is, is normalize that throughout the ecosystem. Thank you. Someone in the back. Um, I didn't notice anything about uh, safety in your slides. Are you avoiding safety domains at this point, or is that in plans for the future? There, or not there is a, actually, there is a functional safety. Uh, there is a group looking at functional safety in ASIL B and, and ISO 26262 within AGL, but it, has not, it hasn't bubbled up to the top of the list in terms of uh, what our, what our, where our code has been focused. Uh, you mentioned that as kind of uh, fusion of uh, GenEV and AGL and uh, all the other things, but uh, how do you coordinate your roadmap in bringing in frameworks, bringing in APIs uh, with GenEV? Is there any coordination? There is there's no formal coordination. We're not GenEV members and we do have we do have members of AGL that are also members of Geneva, and we've incorporated some Geneva components like um, the IVI shell uh, and some of the audio manager components. If one of our members is interested in bringing an AG, uh, Geneva component into the AGL ecosystem, by all means, bring it over. Um, but I. Right now, we don't have any formal coordination. I, I call into the uh, Geneva. Because some points of the roadmap I've seen, they look pretty much like things we have also seen in the Geneva road roadmap maybe a couple of months or already years uh, ago, like like the uh, navigation uh, interface. Agreed. There's a, there's, agreed. There's a navigation API. And we, we've had members ask, well, why don't you use the navigation API from Geneva? I'm not, we're not, AGL specifically is not a Geneva member, so I can't just go grab the navigation spec and pull it over. So what, we, what, was, what we've said all along is, if you're a Geneva member and you're interested in bringing Geneva components in, bring them in. Um, that's, and that's really, what, that's really how we're looking at collaboration. Um, it's hard for us as non-Geneva members to uh, get access to everything behind the, some of their firewalls, so. No more questions? Okay, well hopefully I didn't spout too much gibberish in my semi-delirious state. Uh, thank you all, and um, enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>